Well, this week's sermon is a continuation of last week's sermon, so let me just review for a few minutes what we covered last week, and then we'll move forward. In the first part of the sermon, we addressed uh, Romans 6.1, where it asks the question, are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? And the answer, of course, is no. We're most definitely not to, to continue in sin that grace might increase. But why would someone even ask this question? Uh, the reason is this. The Bible does teach that where sin increases, uh, grace increases more. Romans 5.20 says, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Because grace increases when sin increases, some people have thought and some people have even taught that we should continue in sin and even, and even sin more in order to enjoy more of God's grace. Uh, many people throughout history have taken the free grace of the gospel and used it as a license to sin. The gospel is such good news. We are saved so completely and so freely and so securely that indeed it can be taken to be a license to sin. Now, we're not to use God's grace as a license to sin, but when the great gospel is preached right, God's grace is so emphasized. Salvation is so free and so secure and so sure and so certain that it could be wrongly taken to be a license to sin. And you think about how wonderful God's grace really is. You don't have to work for it. In fact, you can't work for it. The gospel is completely free for the taking. You're given complete and total forgiveness of your sin uh, through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You're given the very righteousness of Christ. You're declared righteous and without guilt by God himself. And this salvation is permanent. It's irrevocable. It can't be lost. You're sealed securely until the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit, and you're held up in the very you're held in the very hands of God. You are baptized into Christ, and we're going to talk about that this evening. And on top of all that, where sin increases, grace increases even more. The gospel is that wonderful, and and so is so secure. God's love is so enduring, so permanent, so unchanging that the gospel has been wrongly used as a license to just keep on sinning. And that's why Paul raises the question, are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? He knew people would be asking that very question. He, he, he knew people would think, why not just enjoy sinning? Why not keep sinning? I'm saved, I'm secure. And even when I sin, God's grace will only increase. Why not just keep on sinning? And of course, Paul said, may this never be. And so the gospel really can be wrongly taken as a license to sin, but it isn't. Paul said, may it never be. But you should know that if you hear a gospel that doesn't sound quite that good, if you hear a gospel uh, that, that couldn't be taken as a license to sin, I know this sounds weird, but if you hear a gospel that couldn't be taken as a license to sin, you, not, you might not be hearing the real gospel of Jesus. Uh, preachers throughout the centuries who have really preached the gospel of Jesus Christ and how free it is and how full of grace it is, preachers like this have always been accused of preaching a gospel that gives you a freedom to just keep on sinning. Uh, Martin Luther had that problem. He, he preached the gospel and he'd preach it right and people would say, you're preaching a license to sin. Uh, the, the gospel doesn't give you a license to sin, but when it's preached rightly, it, it can sound like it. If you hear a gospel that says you can lose your salvation, you aren't hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you hear a gospel that teaches that you have to do works to be saved, a gospel of faith plus works. Uh, you aren't hearing the wonderful grace-filled gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel can be taken as a license to sin because it is so free, so full of grace, and so secure. But Paul says, may it never be. But it can sound that way. Well, that was the first part of the sermon. Then we switched gears. We looked more closely at Romans 6.2. And Romans 6.2 says, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? When asked... Shall we continue in sin? Paul says, may it never be. And then he doesn't stop there. He asks a very, very interesting question. He, he says, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? Last week, we, we raised that question. Uh, what does the Bible mean when it says we died to sin? We talked about several possibilities, several things that it, actually several things that it did not mean, not possibilities, several things it did not mean. But we never answered the question. What does the Bible mean when it says we have died to sin? So Lord willing, we'll do that tonight. And so if you look at, uh, if you look at Romans 6, 2, when asked, shall we continue in sin? Paul says, may it never be. But then he asks, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? Think about how, how would you have responded to Paul? 
Use your imagination for a moment. So, suppose you were the one who had asked Paul, shall we continue in sin that grace might increase? And, and you were just, you were asking a question, you just, you, you really meant it. Paul, should we continue in sin that grace might increase? After all, that's what the Bible said, that when we sin, grace increases. Suppose you were the one who, who had said that to Paul. Paul looks at you and says, may it never be. But he doesn't stop there. He looks at you and he asks you a very pointed question. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? How would you have answered that question? And I want to suggest to you the way I think any one of us would have wrongly answered that question after asking, shall we continue in sin that grace might increase? And then hearing Paul say, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? I think we would have heard it as a rebuke. As if Paul was saying, how could you do such a thing? How, how could you go on and sin? How could you even ask such a question? Should we continue in sin that grace might increase? What are you thinking? How, how could a Christian go on living in sin? We died to sin. Don't you get it? That's how we probably would have understood Paul when he asked, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? We would have taken his question as almost a sarcastic rebuke, and we probably would have become ashamed, and we would have Answer Paul something like this. Paul, you're right. How can we who died to sin still live in it? What was I thinking? And of course we shouldn't continue in sin. Of course we shouldn't sin that grace might increase. What was I thinking? And, and, and Jesus died for me. How could I even ask something so carnal, so ridiculous? What was I thinking? How could I even ask, shall we continue in sin that grace might increase? Well, we might have even said, Paul, I'm going to die to sin from now on. I don't feel like I've really died to sin yet, but I'm going to die to sin from now on. I'm going to renounce sin once again. I'm going to keep, I'm going to, I'm going to keep dying to sin over and over again until I don't even respond to it anymore. You say I've died to sin. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to become dead to sin like a corpse. That's how a Christian is supposed to be, right? I'm not even going to respond to temptation. I think that's how we might have tended to have some answer, maybe not like that, maybe like that. But how shall we have died to sin and still live in it? We would have taken it as a rebuke. But if we answered Paul's question like that, I think, I think Paul would have said, no, no, no. No, no, no. You're, you, you're not getting it. You're not getting what I'm saying. I'm not rebuking you. I'm asking you a serious question. I mean, look, look at Romans 6, 1 and 2 again. It says, Romans, Romans 6, 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? I don't think Paul's rebuking us. I think when he asks, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? I think he's trying to teach us a very profound truth. I think he's saying, how would you continue in sin? How could you continue in sin? Since you've died to it, how would you do it? And I think he'd say it can't be done. When asked, shall we continue to sin that grace might increase? I think that Paul's question, question back is not meant as a rebuke at all, but rather it's meant to be taken like this. How would you continue in sin since it can't be done? You've died to it. How do you think you're going to live in it? It can't be done. Romans 6, 2 says, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? The Christian can't continue to live in sin. He cannot do it because he's truly and really died to it. I'm going to explain this. What does the Bible mean when it says we've died to sin? Well, look at Romans 6, 3. It says, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. The Bible says that we were baptized into Christ Jesus. It says we were baptized into his death. In this verse, we're not talking about the ordinance of baptism. We're not talking about when we get immersed in water in the name of the Father and the, Holy, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Water baptism is a picture of this. And we're supposed to get baptized uh, in, in the water. We're supposed to do it. But water baptism is a picture of this. It's a symbol of this. But the baptism in this verse is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it happens when God saves us. It's not a separate thing. It happens the moment you're saved. When we're baptized into Christ, when we're baptized into his death, this is something done by the Holy Spirit. The word baptize comes from the Greek word bapto and baptizo. Bapto and baptizo. Bapto means to dip or to immerse. 
It can mean to overwhelm. When a person is baptized in water, they are dipped or immersed into the water. They are, in a sense, overwhelmed by the water. When God saves us, the Holy Spirit baptizes us. He immerses us into Jesus Christ. He overwhelms us and joins us to Jesus Christ. And in Christ, we are immersed into his death. We're overwhelmed by his death. We're joined to Jesus Christ in his death by the baptizing of the Holy Spirit. We're going to come back to this, but let me, let me just change thoughts for a moment. Do you remember how the Bible says that we were in Adam, and because Adam sinned, we all sinned in Adam? Do you, do you remember how because Adam was guilty of sin, we were all counted guilty of sin because we were, were, we were in Adam? Adam's sin became our guilt. Adam's guilt became our guilt. Adam's sin became our sin. Adam's guilt became our guilt. All that was Adam's became ours because we were in Adam. In Adam, our nature was corrupted. We were born as sinners, uh, guilty sinners, and sin controlled us right from the womb. Psalm 51, 5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. In Adam, sin raise, reigns. In, in Adam, sin is the master. We're all born under the dominion of sin. It ruled us, and we were its slaves. The life that we lived was a life of sin. It was, it was in our nature to sin. The Bible says we were enemies of God. We were hostile towards him and, and towards his law. We didn't want to keep his law. We couldn't, have kept it. It, we couldn't have kept it then if we wanted to because we were under the dominion of sin. Romans 8, 7 says, because the mindset in the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it's not even able to do so. This is the realm we lived in. That's the life we lived. We were under the, the dominion and power of sin. We were, we were in Adam. Okay, but back to where I was. We were baptized into Christ. And when we were baptized into Christ, we were baptized into his death. When God effectually called you to salvation, the Holy Spirit baptized you into Jesus Christ. He immersed you into Jesus Christ. He joined you to Christ uh, now just as you were in Adam then. Now you're in Christ. Jesus died on the cross, and because you're in Christ, I mean, this is a spiritual thing. It's not the water baptism. That's a symbol of it, but it's a spiritual thing. When God saved you, the Holy Spirit, so just imagine this. He took you and he immersed you into Christ. Okay? He joined you to Christ. You're now in Christ, not in Adam. And because you're in Christ, Jesus Christ died on the cross. Because you're in Christ, you died on the cross too because you're in him. Romans 6, 6 says, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. His death is accounted to you, just as Adam's sin was accounted to you. And Christ was buried. And being in Christ, you were buried in him. Because we are in Christ, when Christ died, we died in him. Because we're in Christ, when Christ was buried, we were buried in him. Okay, this is a spiritual thing, but I hope I'm being clear. Do you, I mean, you guys so far following this okay? Okay, because I know this is kind of, it can be a little confusing, but Romans 6, 3 says, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. Christian, understand how important this is. This is really important. Adam was our federal head. Because he sinned, we sinned in him. And we were counted as guilty sinners even before we actually sinned. We were counted as guilty sinners because we were in Adam. Now that we have been baptized into Christ, now that we are in Christ, Christ's death became our death. Christ's burial became our burial. When Christ died and was buried, we also died and were buried in him. We are now in Christ, just as we were formerly in Adam. And so we ask the question, what does the Bible mean when it says we have died to sin? This will make more sense now. The answer is this. We died in Christ when we were baptized into his death. And we died in Christ. When we died in Christ, we died to our old life of sin. We had a master. Sin was our master. But we died. And we were buried. And that master is no longer our master because we died to sin. We died to it. We died to sin mastering us. We died to, to being in Adam. We were in Adam, but we died to that. We died to our old sinful way of life. 
when a master has a slave, he can, rule, he can rule over that slave as long as that slave lives. But when the slave dies, he can no longer master over him. Christian, sin was your master. Sin was my master. We were controlled by it. We were under his dominion. We were slaves to it. But we died in Christ. And we were buried with Christ. And sin is no more our master. It can no longer have its power over us. It can no longer control us. It no longer has dominion over us because we died and we're buried with Christ. That's what the Bible mean, means when it says we died to sin. We died to being an Adam. We died to our old life. We died to sin being our master. But it doesn't stop there. We died in Christ to our former manner of life. We died to our old master sin, but we didn't stay dead. We were raised in Christ. Look at Romans 6, 4 through 7. <clears throat> Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Christ was raised from the dead, and so, because we are now in Christ, we too were raised in him, we've been raised into a new life. We're no longer in Adam, but in Christ. We're no longer under the reign of sin. We've died to sin, and now, and now we've risen again, but now we've risen in Christ, not in Adam, in Christ. We're now under the reign of grace. It's, let, let me expound this a little bit more, and then I'm going to make some applications. Paul asked, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? The answer is, we won't. We can't. If you're in Christ, the Holy Spirit took you and baptized you, immersed you into Christ. You were joined to Christ, literally. joined, in, and, and when you were joined to Christ, that means you were joined into his death, joined into his burial, and joined into his resurrection. Just as you used to be joined to Adam. And now, because Christ rose, you have risen in Christ and you can walk in newness of life, no longer in Adam. It's like here, here, here you're alive and you have a, a master, you're a slave, but you died, you're buried in the ground. This slave has nothing more to say over you. But now Christ has, you've risen in Christ, and Christ is your new master. You're, you, that's all gone. Does that make sense? You cannot go back to living in sin because you've crossed over to a new realm. From sin and death to grace and life. You cannot live the way you used to. You literally cannot. It's not possible. It's, it's impossible. Because you're a new person. The old self is gone. The old self was crucified in Christ and it was buried. And you are a new person, risen in Christ. You literally can't go back. You've really died to your old life of sin. Romans 6, 6 says, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died is free from sin. And so, Christian, you are in Christ. And because you're in Christ, Christ died and you died in him. And because Christ was buried, you were buried in him. And because, because Christ rose again, you rose in him. And you are no longer under that former manner, that, for, that former master, because you, you've died to that. You've died to sin. You've died to being an Adam. Christ is now your master. You're in him. You're under the reign of grace. Let me talk about this word baptism for just a few more minutes. It'll help you understand what a profound change we have gone through. I said earlier that the word baptism comes from the Greek words bapto and baptizo. Bapto and baptizo, two, two words. Dr. Boyce explains that the word bapto means to dip or to immerse. He also explains that when there's a suffix added to the end of the word bapto, making it baptizo, it slightly changes the meaning. It means that when something is immersed, it comes out changed. Bapto is just immersed. Baptizo means immersed and coming out changed. There was a Greek poet, and I just love this because it really helps the understanding of what happens when we're baptized into Christ. There was a Greek poet and physician named Nicander. He lived about 200 BC, and he wrote a text about pickles. He wrote a text about pickles, and he uses the words bapto and baptizo in his recipe. He said, you bapto or immerse the cucumber in boiling water. And then you baptizo the cucumber in the vinegar solution. When the cucumber was simply immersed, bapto, in the boiling water, there was no change. But when it was 
immersed, baptizo, into the vinegar, it was changed forever into a pickle. It could never go back to being a cucumber. Ever. The word baptizo means there's an immersion, and there's a permanent change after the immersion, and you can't go back. Another example is you could take a white piece of cloth and baptizo it into a container of purple dye, and it would come out changed. It would come out purple. It was for, and it's forever changed. It, it, it cannot go back to being white. It's impossible. That's the meaning of baptizo. That's the actual, literal meaning of baptizo. An immersion with a change. There's no going back. The change is permanent. Now, with that understanding of the Greek language, uh, listen, look at our verse again, Romans 6.2. With that thinking, may it never be, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized, baptizo, into Christ Jesus, have been baptized, baptizo, into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. When we were baptized into Christ, it happened the moment you were saved. Later on, you got baptized outwardly, and that was a symbol of the inner spiritual reality that had already happened. The moment you got saved, the Holy Spirit took you and immersed you into Christ, baptized you into Christ. And when we were baptized into Christ, we were baptized into his death, and the word is baptizo. We've been immersed into Christ, and we have been forever changed, and we can't go back. Can't go back. Thank God, huh? We're no longer in Adam. We can't go back to it. But forever in Christ. We're no longer under the reign of sin and death, but forever under the reign of grace and life. And we've been changed forever, just as pickles can't go back to being cucumbers. Just as dyed cloth can't go back to being white, we cannot go back to being an Adam. We've been baptized, baptized, immersed into, joined forever to Jesus Christ, changed forever. We are forever in him. Does that make sense? Do you understand what this means? That we have died to sin, and that means we have actually died to sin in Christ. We're buried in Christ and have risen in Christ in the former manner of life, being an Adam, being ruled by sin. We are dead to it for real. We can't go back to it. We've crossed over from Adam to Christ. Over here, joined to Christ, died, rose again, now in Christ. Can't go back, impossible. No more than a pickle can go back to a cucumber. From, we're, we've, we're no longer under the reign of sin. We're under the reign of grace. And it's forever. So we have truly and really died to our old life of sin and its mastery over us. Let me make some applications quickly and I'll be done. We, we began with the question, shall we continue to sin that grace might increase? The answer is we can't. That's what it is. Shall we continue to sin that grace might increase? Well, the answer is we can't. And, and, and I hope you see there is no possible alternative but to choose the path of obedience to Christ if you're saved. The life of sin is what we have literally died to. We, we can't go back. And since there's no possibility of going back any more than a pickle can go back to being a cucumber, since there's no possibility of going back from being in Christ to being in Adam, there's no way to go but forward in Christ. And praise God, amen. Praise God for that. This concept is so important to grasp in your sanctification. Christian, you cannot live in sin the way you used, you used to if you're saved. It's impossible. Now, you can sin. And certainly you'll have a fight against the old simple manner of life you're accustomed, uh, that, that, that you've been accustomed to living in. We'll talk more about that as we continue in Romans. But you're no longer under the rule and the dominion of sin. You literally cannot go live in sin as you used to. It's not possible. An adult, for instance, cannot once again become a child. He can act like a child, right? But he can't go back to being a child. It's not possible. We can sin, and we will sin, but we'll never go back to our old manner of life. We can't, not if we're joined to Christ. How shall we continue to live in sin since we've died to it? The answer is we won't and we can't. Think about this the next time you're struggling with sin. Realize it doesn't rule you. You're a child of Christ, not Adam. When you're struggling with sin, you don't have to recommit your life to Christ. You don't have to work up some emotional experience for victory. You just have to realize you're no longer an Adam. 
You're no longer ruled by sin. You're in Christ. It's a fact. Now turn to Christ and get victory. There may have been a time in your life when you had a cursing mouth, even taking God's name in vain. You could not do that anymore, not if you're a Christian. You might get angry. You might slip up. You might curse. But you would be immediately hit with guilt and with shame, both gifts from God. And because you are in Christ, you would repent, and you just could not ever again get comfortable with a foul mouth. Not if Christ is in you. It's impossible. You'd never get comfortable with it again. Not saying it'll never happen again. We struggle with sin. But you'll never be comfortable with it again. It's impossible because you're in Christ. You're united to Christ. Christ will never let you get comfortable with that again. Let's say you've had a, a struggle with pornography, involvement with pornography, and now that's something that's not just with men, it's with women and men. Now that you've been baptized, baptizo, immersed into Christ, that's changed. You're united to Christ, and Christ will never let you get comfortable with that again. Even if you've not yet broken the habit, you know, Christ will not let you get comfortable with it. You might not have totally broken the habit. You'll never be able to do it again the way you used to. Not if Christ is in you. Not if you've been changed from a cucumber to a pickle. It's impossible. It's impossible. Because sin's not your master. And you're in Christ. And you have changed. You've died to sin. Literally, it's not your master. You're over on this side. And you died and you went in the grave with Christ. And you came out with Christ in resurrection. This is a whole new realm. You can't go back to this. You can't. If you've been habitually sinning in any area of your life, as a Christian, the Holy Spirit will convict you. He'll not let you be comfortable in your sin. You will sin. David committed adultery as a man of God, a saved man. But David wasn't an adulterer. There's a difference. He did not continue in the sin. God didn't let him rest until he repented. And so as a Christian, you can sin. You will sin. But you'll not be able to live in it the way you used to. It's impossible. When you sin, you'll be grieved. It will cause you sorrow. When you grieve your Savior, it will cause you shame to walk in the ways of Adam. Because you're in Christ, even your desire to sin will change. It will decrease. And you'll want to please God. Sin will not master you. And if there's a part of you that's still that old stuff, and we'll talk about that when we get farther in Romans, the part that's a struggle. Why is it even a struggle? Because you're not a cucumber. You're a pickle. You've been changed. And so it's a struggle. It matters. You're not the same. You're in a new realm. You're walking in a newness of life. And you're going to fail and you're going to fall. But it's never going to be the same. You can't go back. You can't change back. It's impossible. How shall we continue to sin? How shall we continue to live in sin? We can't the way we used to. Christian, you've been baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ, into his death and into his resurrection. You are in a new realm. You walk in newness of life. You're in Christ. And that's how... We have died to sin and why we can no longer live in it. We can't live in it, not the way we used to, not the way we used to at all. We can sin, but we can't live in it, not the way we used to, because we're in Christ. There's, there's much more to say on this topic. Uh, Lord willing, we'll continue next week. I need to stop, let's pray, and then let's discuss this a little bit. So, Father, thank you that, uh, for the truths in your word. Thank you, Lord, that we can just explore this and see what the word baptizo really means. We thank you, Lord, that that we have been baptized into Christ, joined to him, immersed into him, forever changed, dead to the old realm, walking in the new realm, in newness of life, in Christ. Lord, we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.